Lafayette, Louisiana. Typically, we would open the show by saying it's fun, that it's excitement. Tonight is either of those two things. Tonight, we come in here with heavy hearts. Tonight, we do this show in the shadow of an event that has consumed the city of Lafayette, all of Acadiana, and the United States for the better part of the last four days. Tonight, we continue the healing process following the atrocious events of Thursday night at the Grand Theater, just a couple of miles down the road from here. Tonight, we dedicate our show in honor of the victims of that shooting, including the two wonderful young ladies who passed away. Tonight, we open the phone lines to those of you who are watching, to those of you who need to get whatever emotion or whatever feeling you have off your chest, because Lord knows I'll be doing some of that tonight as well. Tonight, we will, I don't want to say try to make sense of all that would happen. I don't know if we'll ever be able to make sense of what happened Thursday night. But tonight, at the very least, we will try to allow some of the emotion to escape and have a discussion, how odd as it may seem to have that discussion now, about the events that took place last Thursday night at the Grand Theater. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is 124 East Main. I am Ian Ozan, uh, happy that you are here with us this evening. And again, I wish that we could be on a lighter note this evening. I wish that we could be a little bit more jovial this evening. I wish that we could be the usual jocul jocular selves that we are here at 124 East Main. But the sadness, the somber tone that has... that has consumed the city of Lafayette for the last few days is is still above us and hopefully soon it will fully be lifted. It's still amazing to think that a story that we never thought could happen here, an event that we never thought would happen in Lafayette, in the happiest place on earth, according to a poll, we never thought that it would, that terror would knock on our door here. We hear about incidents, uh, incidents of this type in other places, in Colorado, in major cities like Los Angeles and New York. We hear about attacks at numerous other locales, but it all seems so distant because it, it is, because it happens everywhere else. And now Lafayette has become a target. It has become the place that everybody thinks, or it becomes another place rather, that everybody sees on the national news and, and asks what happened. Even we here in Lafayette are asking ourselves what happened and trying to figure out what could drive someone to do this. We may never know. We may never understand. We may never figure out what drove that person to do what he did. I will not reference him by name tonight. And I'm doing my best not to use some choice language to describe this gentleman. But in the four days that have passed, Lafayette has also shown the world that it can be resilient, 
that it can that it can rise up and that it can overcome the obstacles. Chris, thank you for calling tonight. Unfortunately, I can't take the call right now. Uh, call back next week, okay? All right, we'll talk to you then. Bye-bye. The... The fact that Lafayette even for four days has been able to put aside whatever petty differences the bickering and the squabbles that we see on a daily basis on Facebook, on Twitter, on social media especially on certain media Facebook pages that for a short time, people could put all of that aside and channel their focus and their energy on uniting, on helping the victims and their families and raising funds and keeping a hate organization from Kansas from coming to Lafayette. in supporting each other in a time of desperate need. This event, when it was all said and done, for as horrific as it was, brought out the best in our community. And in that, I guess we have some silver lining in all that happened Thursday night. Again, for those of you who want to express what you're feeling, for those of you who have thoughts that you may want to get off your chest, you can call in. We're live on the air until 10 o'clock this evening. The phone number is right there on your screen, 366-8951. That is the phone number. There we go. 366-8951. That is the phone number. Uh, you can go ahead, give us a call, and we'd love to hear from you this evening. While I didn't know either Macy Bro or Jillian Johnson, kind of feels like with all the depictions in media as of late, it feels like that you do know them now. Macy's student at LSU -E, a if I remember right, a radiology student, Jillian Johnson, the owner of Parish Inc., musician, as one local publication described her, a pillar of the business and artistic community here in Lafayette. Two wonderful souls taken from us much too soon. And it's a shame that we didn't get to know them for their further accomplishments that we never got to know Maisie is someone who would eventually help the sick and the Jillian that until now her name was not known on a much wider basis. It's a shame that we only learn about these two people their lives after their lives have ended have been taken from them the other wounded thankfully for the most part are out in the hospital as of this morning there were two left that were still in the hospital I'm not sure if that's been updated or not since 10 this morning but to those who are recovering and who are still recouping after being wounded. Godspeed to you. But I would be remiss if I went any farther 
without acknowledging the first responders. Thursday night was hectic, to say the least, on all fronts. And to the Lafayette Police Department, Lafayette City Marshal's Office, Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Office, Louisiana State Police, Acadian Ambulance, I believe Lafayette Fire also responded as well. And to anybody else that I may have missed in there who went to the scene afterward, especially Lafayette PD who arrived on scene, if I remember right, with about a minute after the initial call came in, kudos to each and every one of you. Thank you for the job that you've done. Thank you for making sure that nothing else happened after the fact. We'll get to that. We'll elaborate on that thought in a second. To those of you from Acadian Ambulance, thank you for helping save the lives you did. Thank you for speedily getting those who were wounded to the hospital. To the emergency room technicians who were ready and were prepared for this, thanks to the word on social media and thanks to local broadcasters getting the word out so quickly, the emergency rooms here in town were able to prepare and be ready for the patients that came in. To those emergency room workers and those hospitals that took care of the wounded, we thank you as well. What people don't realize, especially with regards to law enforcement, is that in many cases, those officers, those investigators, were on the scene for a good 24 hours before any of them ever had a chance to go home and sleep. That's dedication. And again, it proves that they were there and that, and that they wanted to make sure that everything got done right, the scene was secure, and that everybody was safe. We'll finish that thought in a second. Caller, go ahead. Hey, Ian, this is Bert. I'm, I'm so sorry for what happened in the community lately, and I uh, love you very much, my friend. And I uh, appreciate everything you do at the station. I enjoy watching your show. And uh, my prayers go out to uh, the entire community. We are Acadiana strong. Thank you, Bert. We appreciate it. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah. I enjoy watching the GMA in the mornings. And, uh, well, I'll just keep praying for you and, and for everybody else, you know. Thank you, Bert. Sometimes we, we appreciate just, it. Sometimes we just don't understand why God would allow things to happen, but... Uh, we will be strong. Indeed, You're welcome. Will. Thank you, sir. You have a good night. Okay. Go ice skaters. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. <laughs> Going back to the first responders and police, I had a discussion with one of the officers who was on the scene and who, after he after spending all Thursday night, all of Friday, got a chance to at least go home, take a shower, and he was right back out there. It's, we always, and I know recently, especially in the national media, the police have taken a bit of a beating as of late when it comes to their image in, in the news and in the media. But I'll say this, if you didn't have faith in your local police, in the Lafayette Police Department, in the Sheriff's Office, in the Marshal's Office, in State Police, before, you should have every ounce of faith in them now. They did their job and they did it to a T. Thursday night, Friday, and into the intervening days, and right now they're still doing a damn good job in making sure that information gets disseminated and trying to piece together what happened, trying to find 
more information about the bastard who committed that atrocious act. The fact of the matter is, if Lafayette PD don't arrive on scene as quickly as they did, there's a good chance that SOB, not a good chance, there's a, he definitely would have left that movie theater, gone somewhere else, Lord knows where, and would have continued his rampage. And that's a scary thought, is that this situation could have been much worse. But because of the speedy response of Lafayette police and cornering him in that theater, he opted to take his own life, putting an end to his rampage. I know we don't say it enough. But again, thank you to the police, to the ambulance drivers, the fire departments, emergency room staffs, and everyone else, every other first responder, and even to the civilian first responders who are on scene, who assisted in medical treatment until ambulances were able to take all of the victims away. Thank you. Thank you. Now, getting back to the perpetrator. There are folks on social media, especially on uh, Facebook pages of a certain TV station in town, who keep asking, why do we have to hear more about him? Why, why is Lafayette Police releasing more information about him, about his whereabouts, about what they found, about his vehicle, and other things of that nature? Why do we have to hear about the gunman? After all, he's caused enough damage. The man has devastated so many lives and and has put a damper, for lack of a better phrase, on an entire city. Why do we have to hear about a man who came from out of town, took two beautiful souls, wounded several others, why does he get the attention? Why, we, why do you not focus on the families? on the victims. Why do we have to hear about him? He's dead is the question that comes up most often. And I sympathize with those who feel that way. You're right. That son of a bitch shouldn't get any more attention than what he gets. I wish we didn't have to talk about him either. I wish that he could roll away in the winds of history, never to be heard from or seen again. But unfortunately, in a case like this, that's not how it works. I wish it did, but it's not. From a media standpoint, to ignore what he's done to ignore his backstory and to ignore the issues that he had would do a disservice to the story as well as to those who were trying to find out what led him to commit these horrendous acts. To ignore the details about his last few days, weeks, and the last month would be to shirk our responsibility to get to the bottom of this case. And that's the reason why Lafayette Police, why State Police, why the FBI and other agencies who are investigating this case are going to the media and asking 
those who may have seen him, those who may have recognized him from the places that he's been in Lafayette, or for that matter, in Lake Charles and Baton Rouge, because we know he's been traversing up and down I-10. Those who may have recognized his vehicle to come forward with any information as to where he may have been, as to his whereabouts, as to what he was doing. Because believe it or not, those last few days, those last few weeks, those last few steps can help investigators find out what his motive was, if there was a motive. They can help find out whether or not he had been receiving treatment for whatever mental illness he had. It can help police find out if he had, what caused him to choose Lafayette. And I think it's a question all of us want answered is why? Why here? It also can help them find out what his next target would have been if he would have escaped. Lafayette Police, uh, or at least according to a CBS News report, Lafayette Police found a diary in uh, his motel room in which he had the name of the movie, the name of the theater, the time the movie started, all written down in this diary. It would seem that he had his, that he picked his location and knew what he was going to do. The question is whether or not police have found any other evidence to show that he had another location marked. Because again, all signs point to this person going elsewhere and continuing the carnage. I know it sounds strange to say that, but if he would have escaped, who knows what else would have happened. And in the days after, we've all wondered other we've all wondered about how he was able to obtain the weapon, how he was as someone who had had mental health issues, who had had felonies before, how he was able to obtain a firearm. It turns out it turns out the system has failed us, folks. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. The mental health system failed us. And the background check system that the FBI implemented failed us as well. Apparently, the suspect had been treated for mental illness. If I remember correctly, he was involuntarily, involuntarily confined in the previous decade. That should have precluded him from receiving a weapon. However, the state of Georgia, the or I should say the facility in which he was housed, which is located in the state of Georgia, did not input his, or did not submit his information, or check that, if they did submit their information to the state of Georgia, the state of Georgia did not update the FBI registry to note that this gentleman should not have had a firearm, that his mental instability preclu precluded him legally from being able to own a firearm. And it's a shame that this instance here shows a, is, is more proof of the flaws that we have in our system here in the United States. The FBI background check system is great in theory. But unless a state takes the time, if state officials take the time, unless they take the time to input all of the data so that other states can have it, 
there was no point in it. Our suspect purchased his weapon in Alabama. When the background check was run, his name did not appear. There were no flags. He was able to purchase that weapon. And it's because Georgia dropped the ball. Someone in that state dropped the ball in updating the FBI database. And the sad fact is Georgia's not the only state in which there's lax data entry procedures for the FBI criminal database when it comes to purchasing firearms. I don't know what the solution to that problem is. I wish I did. I would like to say that maybe the federal government needs to hold a carrot in front of the states and say if you don't reform your data entry procedures and we'll withhold, we'll withhold funding from you. Dangle that carrot in front of them so the states can step up their game as it were and start entering more and more names into the database. But I doubt that would be effective. Quite frankly, the federal government really doesn't have much money to, to dangle or to take away. Hell, they're almost as broke as the rest of us. The other fact of the matter is, is that the mental health system is crumbling. It's losing funding left and right, both in state and federal levels. And as a result, we're seeing folks like our gunmen not receive the treatment that they need. Now, I'm not justifying his actions by any means. Yes, he was a sick man. Yes, his actions are inexcusable. But, maybe, just maybe, if he could have had the access to the mental health care he needed, or maybe if our laws were stricter and allowed an easier way for involuntary commitment to a facility. Again, I don't know how well that would work. That may be a, a rash suggestion, but part of me thinks that if he would have had the health care that he needed, the mental health care that he needed, that this could have been avoided. Again, I don't know. We don't know what was going through his head. We don't know if he was having a fit of, of mental illness. At this point, it's up to the investigators to figure it out. The other place where I feel that we've been failed, and, and we touched on it a second ago, with regards to the background checks is is our gun laws in this nation and I I know people mentioned it that some people attempted to mention it Bobby Jindal was questioned about it Thursday night and Friday morning and he accused reporters who asked the question of trying to politicize an event while the families were mourning I know there are other people who have taken that same stance. Ted Nugent was one of them. He was in town on Saturday. Many of the folks uh, on, in Facebook land took the same uh, stance. A lot of uh, the Susie Q's and John Q. Publix have mentioned it as well. But the fact of the matter is, is that this instance has to make, a, and this along with the two other shootings we've seen over the course of the last two days here in Lafayette, has to make us at the very least, think that maybe, just maybe, we need to re-examine our gun laws in the state. I'll get back to that thought in a second. On the line right now, if my caller ID is correct, is Marja Broussard, the president of the Lafayette NAACP. Good evening, Marja. Uh, good evening. I just wanted to uh, make a comment and an observation. Absolutely. Um, Go ahead. The uh, response to the, the law enforcement response to the Grand Theater shooting 
was absolutely great. And I believe that the African American community needs to see the same response. Right now we have four unsolved murders. We've had shootings day after day. And the response is just not the same. You know, uh, the Grand Theater, uh, a lot of people believe that it galvanized our community and whatnot. And I, I don't believe that that's actual fact. We see what the media has put on. We see the uh, our elected officials being at the forefront. We see that these law enforcement officers did come in. But the same thing doesn't happen when it's African American lives or black lives. And I believe that that is something that needs to be seen in our community to show a true galvanizing of a community. That's my comment. Thanks for taking it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Marge. Appreciate it. I understand the point, and, and I, I see where you're going. And you're right. Four unsolved murders in the city, if I'm not mistaken, this year. I'm not sure if that... No, let me not throw the Loop Street one in there yet, because that will just happen today. But I understand it is frustrating that... to have the shootings that the North Side has seen, to have the murders that the North Side and the black community in particular have seen is frustrating. And it is frustrating when there are no answers, when it seems that a lot of time is passing before anything comes of it. With that said though, The incidents that have happened recently on the north side of town versus the grand shooting, I, I think we're comparing apples and oranges there. The grand shooting, the response time was, was quick, and the first officers were there partly because, based on what I've told, I, I'm not sure the validity of this, but the person who told me this, I, I would imagine is accurate because he's in the know on this. There were a couple of, uh, there are several officers who were within a couple of blocks of the theater and were able to get there relatively quickly. Now, does that, is there, is that an issue with patrol? Do we need more patrols on the north side? Do we need more, do we need more feet on the ground here? Maybe. I don't know. The other side of that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is in the, with, the, with the grand shooting, it seems like it, I don't want to call it a cut and dry case because there's still a lot of investigating to be done with regards to the why. But the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why, a lot of the basic information is done. The suspect is the suspect was deceased at the scene of the crime. There were many eyewitnesses who were, who were able to give statements to police after the fact. And police were able to develop a case relatively quickly. I know in, with the Simcoe Street shooting from two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago rather, that police said, and again I don't know how accurate it is, I'll take their word at face value, that they're having issues with people coming forward and giving information. Is it because of a trust issue? I don't know. Is it because, as the saying goes, snitches get stitches? Maybe. I think that's part of that as well. I would like to think somebody on the north side knows what the hell's going on. I agree with you, Marja. We need more action taken on that side of town. But also at the same time, I also feel like maybe, just maybe, there's someone who is on this end, and I say this end because we're located on Jeff 101 Jefferson Street, we're right across the, the, the tracks in the Evangeline Thruway from where 
the Simcoe Street shooting took place. We're maybe three quarters of a mile away from that site. I would like to think there's somebody out there in the community that knows what's going on. That aside, from the from those murders that we've seen over the course of the last seven to eight months here on this end of town, what I think a lot of people have missed, especially our leaders here in the city, is the overall bigger picture for the north side of Lafayette. What can we do to make Lafayette's north? And I'm not talking about Upper Lafayette. When I, when I hear Upper Lafayette, I think of the city and the parish north of I-10, going back towards Karen Crew and towards Scott. I'm talking about center city Lafayette from just east of the railroad tracks and the thruway on north towards Interstate 10 and as far south as towards the airport. The The city of Lafayette has forgotten that this part of town exists. And I hate saying that. Maybe that's an overgeneralization. Maybe that's a little bit too harsh. But the fact of the matter is that businesses have moved farther south, they've moved farther west, and in some cases they move farther north towards Opelousas. You look at the center of Lafayette, the center of the city, excluding downtown, and you see an area that has not progressed. I don't want to use the word decaying because that's not necessarily the case. But the fact of the matter is, is that you have a side of the city that has been forgotten by business, that has been forgotten by civic leaders, that has been forgotten by a lot of people. And as someone who grew up on this side of town, that hurts me and it pains me to see that happen. This part of town is better than that. It's more than what can police do. And yes, maybe we need to have more of a police patrol a presence on this end of town. We need more community police, uh, policing on this end. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to what kind of investment is the city itself and, and businesses who come to the city are putting on this side of town. In the last, oh, 20 years or so that I can remember, it hasn't been much. Caller, good evening. Good evening. It's been a long time. I know it has. Good to hear your voice again. How you been, man? Oh, living the dream. You know how that goes. Listen, uh, I agree with a lot of things you're saying. But, uh, you know, like, every, almost every day I see something on television, national news, local news, uh, reading in the newspaper today. But, uh, you know, a lot of people say, say we need stricter gun laws. I want somebody to tell me like uh, what? You know, what? Stricter what? Well, I mean, what's the solution? Explain it to me. I, I, want, I want your opinion. I'm going to throw this out there and I'm going to be devil's advocate with this because my thing is, it, I, but let me preface this by saying, look, you want to own a gun, I've got no problem with that. With that said though, if you're going to own a firearm, I feel that you, before you are able to own a firearm, that you go through a training course, that you are licensed to carry a gun, whether it be, con uh, whether it be concealed or otherwise, that your gun is registered, and that you have to re-up your registration or your training after a certain period of time, whether it's two years, three years, or longer, Whatever that is, I don't know. I'm not the point person on that. I have no problem with private gun ownership. The Second Amendment is there. It is clear. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But we also forget the, for the first part of that statement. A well-regulated militia. And if we're going to consider ourselves, John Q. Public, as a well-regulated militia, the government, whether it be state or federal, should have the right, and I believe has the right, 
to impose limits and impose certain sanctions on those who own weapons. Whether it's outlawing certain types of, uh, of guns, like the Brady Bill did with certain semi-automatic and automatic rifles. Whether it's, uh, or in the case that I proposed, whether it's licensing uh, for guns, much like you get a license for a car. I think there should be certain restrictions. I don't believe in banning guns outright, but I believe in smart ownership, in common sense ownership, and, and regulation of guns. And again, I know somebody out there is going to argue with me by saying that, oh, any kind of regulation or legislation is, is impeding on the Second Amendment. Not necessarily. It says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. They're not telling you that you can't own a gun. They're just telling you you can't own a certain type of gun. Again, maybe I'm, I'm lawyering it up too much. Maybe I'm getting too much into the semantics. But going back to your original question with, the, with what a solution might be, maybe the, the argument I just proposed there. Maybe, license, maybe having people go through courses every so often. They have to go through a course to get, the, to get a permit. Gun has to be licensed with the state. I, I think I don't know if that's the case already or not. I know in some areas it is, and getting and making sure you re up your license every so often, just to make sure that you are doing what is necessary. But also at the same time, I think a lot of, especially a lot of younger go, uh, gun owners, a lot of people who see, oh, that's a gun, that's cool, I want one. The people who get it just to say that they have one and look cool. From what I've seen, it doesn't seem like they take gun ownership seriously. That they don't that they don't take gun safety seriously, and that's the thing. I, I think it was uh, Russell Honore was in the Daily Advertiser the other day and said when he grew up, he grew up around firearms, but when they weren't being used, they were locked up in a cabinet. Nowadays, you see people slinging guns around like like there's no tomorrow, playing with them like they're toys, and we wonder why so many people get hurt in accidents. It's I think part of the I think part of it is making sure that the regulations are there to make sure that those who own guns are responsible and have the training to have it. But I think also at the same time it goes beyond government. I think that we as a general public, for a public that loves its firearms, we need to be more responsible with them. Okay. I mean I agree with everything you just said. But the point still is there is nothing you just said. Mm -hmm. It will stop me if I get pissed off tonight. Go sh I want to go shoot somebody. I'm gonna go shoot them. Right, and that's the you, thing. You, you, you understand the point I'm trying to make? There's nothing that there is no law in the world to stop somebody from going to shoot somebody like the guy did the other night. Okay. Right. I know people. Listen, I know people out there that should not have guns. They're convicted felons, and they brought them out the quick water. They didn't bought it from the friend that bought them on the street. So you understand where I'm coming from? Absolutely. That's why I mean, well, I mean, you can you can take all the courses you want in the world. You can have all the licenses. You can have all the background checks. You can do what you want. That's not going to stop somebody from going to shoot somebody if they if they want to go shoot somebody. And you just brought up the biggest the biggest problem with all this, and that's the fact of the all the under the table dealings with firearms. And, but you're absolutely right, and that's something that I think is lost in the discussion, is that no matter how good of a gun control legislation you have, you will never stop someone who is truly hell-bent on killing someone from killing someone. Thank you. That, you will never do that. And I think those who advocate gun control saying that it's going to be the end-all, it'll be the end-all and be-all for gun violence, are sorely mistaken. Australia and Canada have some of the strictest gun laws in the world, but yet you still see murders happening there. Maybe not at the same clip that you see them here in the United States, but they still happen. Chicago, look at Chicago and New York. Yeah, well, yeah. That's what ha but that's what happens when you have an unwieldy city government trying to enforce laws that a city shouldn't be trying to enforce. That's Chicago and New York City have so many problems right now without the gun debate, that, and they're trying to wade into that, I think that was foolish on their part. They've got they've got bigger fish to fry than that uh, with regard uh, with regards to uh, with regards to education, with regards to drug trade, and with various other reasons. Now, New York City. With that said, for as much flack as people give it, having lived up there for four years, having been up there not too long ago, 
uh, to visit, I feel relatively safe when I walk in New York City. Not because, I, not because of the gun laws that are enforced, but because of what the, in the last 20 to 25 years, starting with the administration of Rudy Giuliani, what, uh, with, I feel more comfortable there because the city was proactive in cleaning up the, the seedier areas, especially Times Square, made them tourist friendly, and have up their police presence in those areas that are heavily populated. Now, are there segments of the city that still see that still have their issues? Absolutely, but not nearly as much as what they used to. But again, there's still problems. Chicago is just a whole nother ball of wax. So let me not let me not touch that. I'm well, listen. On a uh, on a lighter note, uh, I just I just caught the end of the show last week. I said, man. Saying for months, you know, probably at least a year. Where is Ian? I have a clue what's going we, on. But uh, we were on Saturday nights. That's why we just moved back to uh, weeknights. Oh, okay. Then uh, you know, I was really disappointed that Mark left. But I'll, I'll say this: you took his place, so it's all good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, he's back, and I'll be calling you uh, whenever I can. I'm still gonna come meet you one of these days. That sounds good. I appreciate it, Dean. Take care, Ian. Okay, you too, bye. brother. Right, bye bye. I'm glad to know that that D had just didn't know we were on Saturdays. I was wondering because we'd never heard from him uh, when we were on Saturday nights. But I'm glad to know that he's still out there. I'm happy to hear from him. That that just made my night. But uh, and I'm glad he called in because he was able to give me that that platform to get the to open the discussion about gun laws and gun reform. And of course, I'm not naive enough to think that what happened Thursday night will get the discussion going in Baton Rouge or Washington, D.C. The NRA's grip on the Louisiana State Legislature, as well as Capitol Hill, is greater than anybody can imagine. Unfortunately, we're going to hear our politicians continue to say, praying will get better. I think Bob Mann put it best, if all you're doing is praying and hoping that the problem will go away, then you're in the, long, you're in the wrong line of work as a politician. Good evening, Z. Hey, what's going on? Not much. What's happening? Uh, I've been missing your show. What, 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 what you been talking about tonight? Really? You're going to call in four, uh, 49 minutes into the show and ask what we're talking about? Uh, we've been... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the grand, we've been doing a lot of the grand theater, just getting well, stuff. I, I know you were talking about. I was listening to you talking about somebody with gun laws and everything. Uh, what was that all about? Uh, we we went from a natural progression and wound up with the gun laws. And after the incident happened, uh, Governor Jindal was asked by reporters on that's, Thursday. That's, uh, not not to cut you off. That's exactly what I was talking about. How do you like this? 360 degree turnaround, or if you want to call it 180 degree turnaround, on his views on gun control laws after the situation in Lafayette. You know, it takes something like this for him, and, and somebody actually put him on the spot when he was on TV mm -hmm. because he was always one who figured, you know, put the guns in the hands of everybody, but now all of a sudden his attitude has changed because of this situation here in Lafayette. What do you well, think about that? Well, the thing is, I. The first two days he punted, saying that it was not the right time to politicize. Agree with that thought or not is one thing. But the fact that he said on Sunday that he thinks maybe there should, that there should be restrictions on those with prior mental issues, I don't think it's a complete 180. No. I he, but with that his, said... His whole focus, his whole focus, and you know the, the focus of the Obama administration has been, of course he's always been anti-Obama, mm -hmm. but the whole focus is, that, you know, the president has been stressing for a long time that uh, we need to have strict the gun laws, especially uh, pertaining to people like this idiot who went out and did what he did uh, last Thursday, but, you know, he has always been anti-Obama, anti-Obama, now all of a sudden, it, you know, when, when he slapped in the face with the issues going on in his own state, he decides that, yeah, maybe we should have strict the gun laws. He does not fool me for one second. Yeah, but then, you know, it, it's a shame of what happened at Lafayette. And yeah, we do need tighter gun laws. But the fact of the matter is, 
anybody out there today can get a gun. And, and as far as screening people who are getting them, it's sad to say that that people like him, they actually have, uh, some of them are allowed to have, they get out there with better weapons than what our police officers carry. Yeah. And it's sad to say. You know, it's, it's horrible. It is. Now, going back to the point with the governor and stricter gun laws, like I said a second ago, I'm not going to be so naive to think that even if he said it, that anything's going to happen. Remember, the NRA practically owns the state legislature. Let's just lay they, they that do. out there. But with that said, on a future edition of this show, I want to get Terry Landry and Blake Miguez in here to talk about it. Terry was the oh, first. That would be great. That would be great. Terry was the first one to mention gun control. He mentioned it during one of the press conferences on Friday. Blake Miguez is a competitive shooter. A uh, former contestant on the TV show Top Shot, and is now in the state legislature himself. I would love to have both of them on this show, and I may arrange that for the next in the next couple weeks to get them in here to discuss gun laws and uh, and what should happen in the wake of the Grand Theater. Uh, I thought about that earlier today. It was too late to try and get them in tonight, but I'm going to see if I can work on getting the, getting those two legislators in here because if nothing else, it'll make for a hell of a discussion. Do you see a problem with metal detectors in the doorways of uh, movie theaters? I don't, but I'm opposed, to, I'm opposed to them for one reason. Not that it wouldn't make it safer. It would. But I'm going to the movie theaters. I, when I walk in the movies and I buy my ticket and I go in and sit down, I'm trying to escape reality. The fact that there's a metal detector at the movies putting in the back of my mind that I'm not truly escaping reality that there may be someone who's coming in here and may want to hurt me. And the fact of the matter is, even with the metal detector, if someone wants to walk up to that metal detector, is carrying a concealed weapon, pulls out and opens fire on a crowded lobby, we're back at square one. Not a damn thing The whole point about changed. the metal detector is he's not going to get through there unless he's carrying some kind of thing that can, that can uh, get through the metal detector without being uh, uh, noticed, you know. And that's the, the thing. The whole point with behind it is is to make it safer and you know you can have security there and whatnot I mean we do it with a lot of other events that go on they do it at football games today in stadiums and whatnot mm -hmm. why not in movie theaters you know I mean my thing is you got a lot of kids that go to movies and I'm one who doesn't frequent the movies yeah and I haven't done it for years mainly because of the fact that the noise that goes on and some of the distractions I'm one who's easily distract and, and before I go to a movie theater I prefer to watch it wait for it to come on TV and watch it at home because yeah. I'm one who's easily distracted and sometimes you might miss one line that'll keep me from finding out what's going on I know you got to get off pretty soon yeah. but the point is I think as long as it saves somebody's life and hell go ahead and do it because today we're not we're not dealing with normal individuals I mean look at this guy this guy's been hanging around last year for how long now a month and, and, and yeah, and look what happens, you know? So why not, you know? Yeah. Well, I appreciate the call. I'll become vigilant and, and, and on the, you know. Say so what? I said it's either that or you become vigilant and, and put the shoe on the other foot and, yeah. and look out for people like this. But in a the movie theater, it's always dark. You never know what's going on. And then the thing is, you don't want everybody going in there with a gun because if something goes wrong, you might have shoot people shooting for some unknown reason at all, you know? Yeah. Especially somebody who's not expertise in handling a gun. Yeah. I've got 30 seconds left. I appreciate the call. Okay. Well, we'll talk to you later. I'll catch you next week. Sounds good. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Right, bye. Bye. We've got uh, about 20 seconds left in the show, so I'm going to make this brief. Thank you for all who called in tonight. For those of you who have been rallying to help the community, Thank you. For those of you who want to make a donation or want to find the various efforts uh, that are making donations to the victims, KATC.com has a full list. And speaking of KATC, I made a mistake of reading the comments on Facebook earlier with some of the other stories. And it looks like people are going back to the same old tricks of race baiting, of calling people names, and we're getting divisive again here in Lafayette, folks. It's been four days after the shooting. Let's not pull that crap. It's too early. We should have learned our lesson already. Let's stick together. Let's be Lafayette strong, and let's do it for longer than four days, folks. Come on. We're better than that. Until next week, folks, good night.